final presentation in this afternoon's uh, first session is uh, going to be by Dr. Mike Wolf and Rick Danver. Uh, Mike Wolf is going to be presenting. And um, Mike is a professor here at Utah State University, has been for what, three or four years now? Um, and um, he's here in the Department of Wildland Resources. His primary research interests are. Um, on wild ungulates and their principal predators, cougars. Um, he's also served with the Division of Wildlife Resources as the mammals coordinator for two grueling years. Um, the co-presenter is Rick Danver. Uh, Rick Danver has a degree here from Utah State University. And uh, Rick has uh, been working at Deseret Land and Livestock since 1983, first as a wildlife biologist and now as a wildlife manager. Uh, Rick also has served on the Division of Wildlife Resources Wildlife Board, um, one of the co-founders of the QRM uh, member uh, on the Habitat Council for the Division of Wildlife Resources. The list goes on and on, uh, much too long to go through. Um, but we'll start with Dr. Wolf and help me welcome him, please. So the procedure is the same. Um, I hope that you'll ind indulge me this afternoon in kind of a quasi-historical perspective on the topic that I want to talk about, or that we want to talk about. Over 30 years ago, Thomas Vail, in a significant publication, labeled sagebrush conversion as an important element of change in Western, the Western landscape. Um, and it, the purported but frequently uh, not the principal intent of many of these projects, or some of these projects at least, was the improvement of big, grain, big game or, or ungulate habitat. Um, and I believe that much of the benefits that uh, they are from were largely illusory and maybe coincidental to uh, the real intent of those things, which was mostly as a livestock, livestock, improving livestock forage more than anything else. But I think this notwithstanding, some of this experience has given us some valuable lessons, some of which I'd like to share with you this afternoon, uh, and hopefully as though we can glean from some of those in what I tend to call sort of newer generation sagebrush uh, restoration kind of things. Uh, the other couple other points that I'd make before we kick this off really is that I note that unlike Janet's topic here, we got a whole pile of information on uh, big game uh, forage utilization, nutrition, and all that sort of stuff, including chemical defenses and that sort of stuff. We've largely glossed over a lot of that because it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's probably not peripheral, obviously not peripheral, but probably we might detract from sort of the central focus of this afternoon. Um, and including some of that that we'll make use of, but some of the work that Dr. Fred Provenza has done with behavior and chemical deterrence and sort of that stuff. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And finally, before we get started, I'd like to say that some of the generalizations we'll make this afternoon may not be completely, uh, well, certainly they can't um, essentially apply over the entire spectrum of the sagebrush biome that Dr. Knick is, that Steve Knick was talking about this morning recognizing that the three ungulates that we're going to be focusing on occur over most of that entire thing. So uh, there's a level of generalization that we'll, we'll have to put up with, I guess. There are three major ungulates uh, so that we want to consider this afternoon. And those are essentially elk or wapiti, mule deer, and pronghorn antelope. There are others too, like bighorn sheep and bison that utilize sagebrush habitat, but not to the extent and not to the degree that these things do. And so what I've tried to do here is to summarize uh, sort of the sagebrush step as big game or wild ungulate habitat. Okay. And needless to say, it provides forage for elk, mule deer, and pronghorn. Uh, and we'll talk more about the forage in just a minute. Um, of, these, of these three species, probably elk is the most generalist and occurs as a throughout the area. Uh, some, of the, some of the populations are migratory, some are not. For instance, in eastern Washington on the Hanford Reservation, there's a population there that spends the entire year basically in sagebrush steppe. Um, whereas other populations, like some of the ones we see around here, tend to be somewhat migratory, migrating to higher elevations during the summertime. 
Um, deer uh, are probably as closer uh, than some of the other species to what we might call a sagebrush obligate. They're obviously not a sagebrush obligate, but I think they're more dependent upon sagebrush and the shrub, uh, the shrub step ecosystem uh, than some of the other species. Okay. And certainly pronghorn, if you think about the history, you go back to, I think, Yoakum in 1978, mentioned that an estimated 20%, or not 20, but 27% of the then continental uh, pronghorn population was found in what he called sagebrush grassland, uh, with the rest of the population being in sort of uh, more traditional grasslands. However, given the continued sort of decline of continental grasslands, probably the increasing prop, uh, pronghorn population, this, the restoration that we've seen here, has probably become particularly important in the overall size of the, uh, of the continental pronghorn population. Okay. So here we see some other things. Uh, forage for all three of the species. We'll talk more about, them, about that in just a moment. Uh, security cover and bedding sites. Uh, bedding sites for, um, uh, well, pronghorn uh, forns, so worked by Aldridge et al., uh, even mule deer by Maine and Koblenz, uh, and even elk, for that matter, in southeastern Idaho uh, by Strohmeyer and Jim Peak and those people. Okay? And so we'll look at those habitat things in just a moment. And also sagebrush. Uh, step provides limited winter thermal cover. Oops. Uh, this little graph here just shows you that shrubs, this is from Watt Robin's book on uh, wildlife nutrition, these are looking at wind profiles over bare ground as opposed to grasses and shrubs and this sort of thing. So in some cases, if you're talking about convective heat losses, shrubs can actually be an important, important habitat component. And I would argue particularly for mule deer more than anything else. Okay, what about sagebrush as forage for wild ungulates? Okay, and these are the crassest of generalizations, uh, recognizing that they occur over a, uh, an entire uh, biome that we're talking about. Okay, um, sagebrush comprises winter browse for uh, basically all three of the species. Uh, it's less preferred than some other species. If you think about antelope bitterbrush or uh, curly mountain mahogany, so those are the ice cream species. Okay. So it's probably less preferred, but it's got a couple things going from it. And actually, if you look at it, some taxa are preferred over others, but as Wombold has mentioned, uh, virtually all of them are potentially value, valuable forage sources. And the reason why sagebrush is an important forage component is the fact that it has relatively high protein content, and in the wintertime, in severe winters at least, depending upon the stature, it's basically uh, the only thing, the only game in town. And so that's what, that's what you have here. We were all known for a long period of time, that going back to the days of Art Smith and the sort of thing, that the digestibility of sagebrush is limited due to secondary compounds. And if you fit, if that's the only thing that they have to eat, exclusive diets may cause weight losses and reproductive failure. Okay. Uh, and this is where I mentioned before some of the work that Dr. Provenza and his students have been doing uh, has done a lot to sort of illustrate that. And so this illustrates the importance of mixed diets. If you're going to have sagebrush, you probably have to have some other things to go along with it. Okay. The other thing is that sagebrush can be an alternative forest species during the summer. And this is particularly true during drought. And in fact, with antelope, uh, some of the work that uh, Art Smith did back in the 70s, Smith and Beal, they found that during the summertime and in a drought situation, uh, as Artemisia was the primary forage species that those animals used. Okay, okay perhaps more important than the uh, food preferences per se is looking at something to deal with uh, seasonal changes in nutrient content. And here again, I'm sort of uh, glossing over things. But if we look, and this actually this uh, slide right here shows a graph actually taken out of uh, uh, John Cook's chapter on uh, nutrition for elk in the new elk book. Uh, and they're looking here, but this is actually from, from Barbara and Phillips, but crude protein content and digestible dry matter of cattle, so it's a cow, it's a, it's a cow diet, 
but there are some parallels that we can see for all three of these species. And if you look basically, what happens is that fruit protein and digestible dry matter actually are high, fairly high, we all know this, fairly high during the early part of the growing season. And as the growing season progresses, they tend to decline. And then actually later on, maybe at the end of the summer, you might get some precipitation, which encourages the growth of grasses and forbs, increases their digestion, uh, their uh, fruit protein content. And the same thing is true in dry matter digestibility. Okay. However, if you have a drought situation, that tails off pretty, pretty rapidly and so then stays relatively low. So the important point here is that uh, if you think about the annual cycle of the animals involved, that this area in here, this time period in here, is the time, well, it's actually late gestation, it's lactation, it's growth of neonates, and ultimately, to some degree, the survival, if you will, uh, and the population response of some of these ungulates, particularly uh, probably deer and pronghorn and this sort of thing, may be uh, an important component, or let's say related to that, or is probably related to that. So that's the importance of this thing. Note that if you have maybe browse or something like that, which might have a lower content uh, than some of these species, even during the growing season, that can serve as a backup. Okay, But note that probably that's probably maintenance fodder more than anything else. Whereas, if you're looking at trying to make, uh, improve your population performance, probably these things are of particular importance. Okay. okay, this is a little bit uh, of a, the same kind of ordination thing we've seen earlier this morning. We're going to focus on basically pronghorn, mule deer, and elk and this sort of thing. And note that if you think this is basically sagebrush cover and height, here would be a meter here, so what we're going to call dense, maybe decadent, rank sagebrush, and this sort of thing. Note that of the three species, pronghorn, and these, these are only approximate. You'll probably see this in Rick's talk later on as well, but um, that pronghorn tends to be more of a grassland species. Think about what they're doing. Basically, they rely on vision as, as an escape, me and, and escape mechanism. Elk probably span almost the entire spectrum. Whereas mule deer tend to be a little bit more on the upper end of things. Okay, so those are the things that we want to think about as we go through some species-specific considerations. Uh, another way of looking at this is something that came out from Kinchi and Jim Yoakum and stuff like that back in 1982 that kind of puts it together reasonably nicely. If you look at four ground cover, these are components of pronghorn habitat. Four ground cover, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 10 to 30 uh, percent. Shrub ground cover, probably 10 to 20 percent, not much above 25 percent, this sort of thing. And vegetative height, probably uh, in the neighborhood of, you know, maxing out probably a little bit between 50 and a, uh, 75 centimeters, okay? That would be for pronghorn. And again, think about the utilization that that, is a, because they're probably, they're visually oriented in terms of uh, escape mechanisms for predators and things like that. So, what then are some of the consequences, and this has been the focus of the day, of overmaturation, if you will, of sagebrush? Okay, there are really two consequences uh, for uh, ungulates that we're looking at. One is that the volume, the probable volume and available, of available and nutritious forage is reduced. Much of it becomes basically woody. Uh, this stuff may even be out of reach to some degree and perhaps may not be of the same nutrient quality, quality than some of the younger, uh, vigorously growing sagebrush. Okay. The other thing, as we've all talked about, is that this kind of stay in a sagebrush tends, although this is not universally accepted, but it's generally accepted, but these stands of sagebrush tend to reduce the shrub, uh, to reduce the forb and grass component underneath, the herbaceous component, which, as I mentioned before, would be particularly useful uh, to uh, growing, uh, lactating, that kind of thing, sort of the reproductive component, if you will. So the objective then, as, as we've heard on several occasions, uh, is really to reduce the volume here, reduce the overstory, reduce the density of this, reduce the stature, so that we can encourage the growth of herbaceous materials underneath. 
So, uh, given that, what should we be thinking about, basically, in terms of objectives and guiding principles? Okay. And so, these, what we're, in most cases, what we're trying to do is to improve body condition, maybe including antler size, and or population demographics. And as I'll point out a little bit later in the talk here, uh, this is maybe where the rubber meets the road because sometimes we have difficulty uh, actually documenting those responses. So we may be looking in efforts to improve fecundity, uh, neonatal survival, basically. If you come combine those two, you know, the, the number of fawns that hit the ground, uh, as well as their early survival, uh, this would be, uh, you know, kind of out to recruitment. And ultimately, we, we may want to look at improving, or let's say, increasing our density. We want more animals. Maybe we don't, but as in this case, this is what we're looking at. Okay. Another possibility that we might try and use sage, or let's say, uh, habitat restoration for is influencing animal distribution. And here we might be looking either to attract or hold animals at a given location. And maybe what we're trying to do here is to one of two things. Maybe to minimize uh, elk, for instance, getting into haystacks, going off a of property or something like that. We might want to keep them uh, to, to reduce ag agricultural depredation. And the other thing we might want to do is to keep them off the highway. Okay, Imagine uh, an elk herd it goes out onto an interstate or something like that could cause a uh, significant amount of uh, trouble. Okay. So, um, basically, I'd like, this is kind of uh, the, the, the center point of, of my talk this more, of, of this afternoon. I'd like to compare a little bit what I'm going to call conventional sagebrush treatment programs uh, versus uh, maybe more modern progressive ones. And as we all know, um, conventional programs have had a rather checkered history. Um, earlier programs were oriented primarily toward <coughs> vegetative conversion, um, namely the removal or eradication of sagebrush and replacement with grasses. And as you, most of you know, the grasses that we utilize were usually uh, fire or grazing tolerant, uh, introduced grasses, and for that maybe even a little bit fire tolerant and this sort of thing. And we had things like large contiguous treatment blocks uh, with minimal interspersion of residual, residual, residual cover, uh, oftentimes monotypic seeding, usually with uh, things like crested wheatgrass and stuff like that. The other thing is that we anticipated, or people anticipated, a long return interval for sagebrush reinvasion. The idea was get rid of the stuff, okay, with the assumption of permanent or almost permanent change. I mean, anybody realistically knew. Uh, that, that would not happen, but that was the effort that people were invoking. More recently, I think we've seen a, I, I like to think at least, a newer generation of sagebrush treatment scenarios. Uh, sometimes we can call this rehabilitation, restoration, rejuvenation, all kinds of different uh, uh, handles here. But you can see some of the things that have gone on here. The objective really is the rejuvenation of the community and an important point, the restoration of function the functions that I talked about of the sagebrush uh, step ecosystem. Uh, less drastic invasive treatment methods, uh, greater species diversity of plantings or seedings, and some treatment blocks as a, with greater interspersion of untreated areas. So we get this moment mosaic that Steve was talking about earlier. Okay, And the need for treatment methods are tailored to some degree to, to site characteristics and to accomplish specific objectives. Okay. Um, so, I think a key to this, and this is where one of the things comes out, is this whole idea of uh, what is the appropriate mosaic, uh, and in some, that's what we're going to be looking at here in a prescription in just a moment. Okay. Uh, there's something that's come out of the forestry literature uh, in terms of emulation of natural disturbances, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the idea is that even though we may not use the same techniques, the same, we might using mechanical treatment or something like that, that we're trying to emulate or simulate some of the natural disturbance regimes that went on. Okay. 
This is obviously all geared toward forestry, but I think you can make kind of the same argument, if you will, for sagebrush, sagebrush treatment as well. Okay. And so the key component here is that while the agent of disturbance may not be natural, what we're trying to emulate is the effect of that disturbance. And this brings in the whole question. We might think about using uh, native or non-native uh, species for that matter. Okay. So, uh, needless to say, most of you are probably familiar with the techniques that are employed, and uh, most of these are photos, or all of them, I guess, are photos from uh, desert land and livestock. Uh, this is an imprinter, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, tools that's fairly widely used there right now is the air, the Lawson aerator. Fire, fire can be either, we'll talk about in a moment, spring burns versus summer and fall burns or spike, which is a trade name for tebuthyron, which can be used to uh, kill, differentially take out sagebrush, depending upon the application rates. So uh, here are some examples again. Here's an aerial view of a spring, bur spring burn. Uh, look at the interspersion that we're getting there. Uh, here's a, a, a ground level view of that. Aerator treatment. Um, increased edge there. Here's a uh, aerator treatment, and basically um, a uh, this is a bunny burrow. It was right next door to the thing. So okay, uh, some disc and planted treatment. Okay, brush and thin by sheep. And this is a 1992 burn, although the taken photo taken 15 years later. Okay, what are some of the options and constraints? Uh, I think the main thing here is that adaptive treatment has to consider a variety of things, slope, topography, precipitation regime, and so as I mentioned before, sometimes higher elevation sites with higher precipitation may be more forgiving than lower sites. Uh, uh, here is an area that uh, basically had a fair interspersion of bitter brush in it before, and so probably what we didn't want to do here was to treat that with fire, and so... Um, uh, perhaps this would be an area, this was an area that was used for tebuthyron treatment, spike treatment. Okay, uh, last little bit, uh, animal response. Uh, we see, oftentimes we see increased utilization, oftentimes temporary to following treatment, demonstrated by numerous investigations. This is probably attributable short-term increases in the production of herbaceous species. However, somebody like uh, Van Dyke and Dara documented that some of these burn sites uh, in southwestern Montana may be used up to 15 years following treatment. My point is that documentation of population level responses may be more problematical. And given the time constraints, maybe I'll skip ahead a little bit to something. Uh, this is a, uh, some work that was done by uh, Anis Audi and, and Rick, um, and basically looking at uh, a variety of treatments looking at a population response here, one of the things that they found, this is with pronghorn antelope, and if you look at this, the population, one of the things they found was uh, essentially that there was a density dependent response in fawn production. And so things would, uh, basically they would increase for a while, fawn production would increase, but then you'd reach a point when the population peaked out and it would decrease. Following treatment, basically, we found that the population both increased and the fawn production increased as well. And so, change in pronghorn population, pre-treatment was 600. Uh, Post-treatment, you can see that both the population and production had increased. The point here being that this was sufficient to override uh, the density-dependent constraints. Okay, I'd like the last thing I'd like to do is mention very briefly something about what I'll call prescriptions. And this is the idea, how can we tailor these things maybe for pronghorn, mule deer, and elk? And to do that, let's take a look at this thing. And basically what we have here are three scenarios. Think about the amount of residual sagebrush that's in, in the mix. Over here we have, on the left, we have pronghorn antelope. This is uh, about 55 bucks in one area. See? almost no sagebrush left in that. Remember our elk, I talked about before, tend to be more generalist if you think about them. They would have a little bit more sagebrush in the matrix here, okay, uh, or the matrix there. 
And think about deer, where I mentioned before, they probably need to have a greater amount of sagebrush for these other functions. And so one of the strategies that I go back to is at least for deer management, rather than sort of broad brush treatment, uh, maybe we need to think about punching holes in the residual matrix more than anything else. And so uh, with that, um, I think I'd conclude by saying that we need to have, as has been mentioned on several occasions before, a diversity of some of these things out there and that the prescription may not be the same for all, uh, but there probably is common ground there that we can, we can look at. So I think that. So thank you. Start off with one of somebody else is going to jump in the fray. Um, a lot of the carrier treatments and some of the other treatments, you see that um, even some of the definite sagebrush put out flower shoots early in the season. Do we know how the ungulates are treating those on those same old sagebrush that they might not have eaten otherwise? You want to respond to that? Frank, I'm not exactly sure I understood. Um, you're saying some of the Stuff we would call decadent, put out like the flower yeah, decadent patch, and you treat part of it. The stuff that's next to the treated part will actually send up a bunch of fresh flower shoots uh, in response to the in response to the treatment. And, and are, are the ungulates using those on those old sagebrush that they probably wouldn't have eaten otherwise? That's a good question. I, I would, I just would assume that they were, but I, I have not. I, we haven't looked at that. We'll say, but. Yeah, so whether they, you're saying whether they would come in and browse on those shoots, I would assume so. Okay. Any, any coherent questions from the audience? <laughs> 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 no, I had that same question because people told me that um, when you set them back and it's, there's something about the young shoots that they've got more chemical in them or something and that the ant, animals don't like to eat them. Um, but I would have thought the young shoots would have been more palatable, but maybe that's just on other drugs, not safer. I wanted to know the answer to that same, that same question. My experience with defensive chemicals is a, and, and the response to browsing uh, has been more with moose. So I looked at some things where basically when you get some willow and birch and this sort of thing, the younger ones that are need to be protected, the ones that are up on top don't really need to be protected as much. But this may be overridden by the fact is that there's a greater degree of, uh, of uh, energy available there. So, I mean, there's a trade-off. This would be something that Fred Pavinzo would, or somebody would probably have to answer. What is, what is the relative defensive chemical content of new adventitious growth versus sort of the older growth? That's 